2020 was a nightmare of a year, wasn't it? There's been more ridiculousness in this past year than in a long time, what with all of the challenges that we faced, and it's time to put Terrible 20 to bed. For starters, 2020 was an election year. Donald Trump was seeking a second term, and to be honest, I thought that he had a solid chance of being re-elected. The Democratic Party fielded a bunch of yawners for candidates, with the possible exceptions of Tulsi Gabbard and Bernie Sanders. Gabbard had some common-sense, moderate policy proposals and absolutely destroyed her opponents during the primary debates. And I admit that I liked her. I don't like Sanders, of course, because his policies lack as much common sense as Tulsi's possess, but I admit that there's some serious support out there for him. Of all the boring people in that bloated field, though, the one candidate who made me yawn the most was Joe Biden. He was a tired, confused old man with tired, confused old policies, and I didn't think that he stood a chance of making it through the primary season. Shows how much I know, right? In a regular election year, with the president running for re-election on a record of economic growth, low unemployment, and strong policy positions, Trump would have swept the field. Of course, Terrible 20 had other ideas. The wild card was COVID-19. This disease, a relative of the common cold with some significantly more sinister fatality rates, rolled over the world. Normally, governments try to keep things going as best they can during a pandemic, but with COVID, it seems that few were willing to take any chances. We saw mask mandates. We saw shutdowns for non-essential businesses. We saw lockdowns with people stuck in their homes, either working by remote or unable to work at all. Naturally, the economy tanked. Unemployment skyrocketed. And since every policy decision that Donald Trump made was already being cast in a negative light by the major media outlets, we saw report after report of how the president wasn't following recommended guidelines, wasn't doing enough to stop the spread, and just didn't care about working Americans. Now, I honestly don't think that Trump did that badly given the circumstances. He got the federal agencies working with the states to provide support to them. He got private businesses to switch production to provide critically needed supplies and equipment. He got us all to put on masks, social distance, and avoid unnecessary exposures at least at first. And most of all, he told Congress to put an aid package together and send it to his desk, promising to sign it, and then he carried forward on that promise when the aid package finally arrived. Then, as happened pretty much every year, some suspects wound up dead during arrests, and the tension from months of lockdowns boiled over. It started in Minneapolis, and Terrible 20 added widespread rioting to COVID. Now, I would have thought that gathering together in huge groups during a pandemic was something that the states would have clamped down on hard. So, of course, many of them didn't. It's the right of every American to protest, and evidently there's more than a few people out there who think that right is significantly more important than preventing the spread of COVID, so long as the reasons for protesting are for the right cause. I would think that, given the financial damage to businesses already being done by the lockdowns, Preventing physical damages to the same businesses would be a priority, but letting people smash up downtown districts was considered an important bit of free expression in a lot of cities. The president told governors and city officials who did not act to stop the rioting right away to get their responses going, but those elected officials seemed to sympathize with the rioters and cut police funding and presence instead. Of course, when the president wanted to get out and campaign, every event he hosted was quickly labeled a super spreader event. Why? Because it seems that burning down businesses, looting, pulling down statues, defacing property, declaring portions of cities to be autonomous zones, and generally trashing everything in sight is supposed to be less likely to spread COVID infections than political rallies for the incumbent president. Meanwhile, that tired, confused old candidate with the tired, confused old policies had somehow managed to defeat all other Democratic challengers, including popular socialist Bernie Sanders, to win the nomination for president. How he managed that by campaigning from his house, especially after early defeats in the primary season, I still haven't figured out, but he did it. Then, just to add more question marks to Terrible 20, he selected a running mate who had garnered some early support, but dropped out before the first primary vote after being annihilated in a debate 
Kamala Harris. If it were any other year but Terrible 20, I would have assumed that the Biden-Harris ticket was a sacrificial run against an incumbent that was very likely to win re-election. Joe had already been defeated in several past presidential runs during the primary season, and Kamala had limited experience in national politics and not much to add to the ticket. When their campaign kept fielding interviews from Joe's house and making virtually deserted appearances with a few dozen socially distanced reporters and pretty much no one else, a lot of Trump supporters believed that Biden didn't have much chance to beat the guy who could get thousands of people to show up to every campaign rally despite the pandemic. Congress had a perfect opportunity to show the American people how to overcome political differences and work together on a common cause. Congress has done this before in history, after all and they should have done it again. Instead, the partisanship and political maneuvering in Congress ratcheted up to new heights. People needed to work, but Congress did nothing to get them back to work. Small business owners needed help to avoid bankruptcy, but Congress argued about what help to provide and misdirected what aid they sent to large businesses who could more easily adapt to and better weather this crisis, leaving small business owners no other choice but to shut down operations permanently. People needed to survive all of the temporary and later permanent job losses, but Congress did nothing to reopen the country and argued endlessly over how much and what kind of aid they were going to provide people who can't work, can't pay their bills, and can't afford to wait. It was an election year, after all, and the parties had a vested interest in making themselves look as good as possible while blaming everything bad on each other. Normally, the media's role during such times is to publish anything and everything they can find about how both sides of Congress are acting like idiots, but they were firmly committed to Orange Man Bad and had therefore chosen sides before this happened. So, according to the media, everything good came because the Democrats in Congress wouldn't give up on us, and everything bad came because Trump's GOP buddies held up much-needed relief bills. Nancy Pelosi vigorously negotiated with Steve Mnuchin instead of Mitch McConnell, because then whatever agreement was reached with Mnuchin would be rejected by the Senate majority and make both Trump and McConnell look like obstructionists. Meanwhile, Biden kept promising the moon to the few dozen socially spaced reporters covering his campaign, who turned around and reported those promises to the rest of us as if they were going to be the salvation of the country. Um, no. Just... No. By Halloween, Terrible 20 had us all believing that we were living in a psychological thriller. We survived, struggling, but somehow making it because that's what people do in a crisis. Politicians kept making hay out of every bit of news, debating, running ads, and in the Biden campaign's case, sending out stories which the media dutifully published. Yeah, by Halloween, we were all fed up. And November would give us a chance to vote and end all this political haymaking. Elections are supposed to do that, after all. Not in Terrible 20. Somehow, even something which is supposed to be as closely regulated as a national election managed to wind up completely discredited from the perspective of half the country. The vote totals from 2016 to 2020 increased by 26 million votes, despite the lockdowns and limitations created by COVID. Joe Biden, the stealth candidate who campaigned largely from his home, somehow got over 80 million votes, the highest tally in the history of the country. Trump, meanwhile, racked up the second highest vote tally in U.S. history. Is it possible? Certainly. Does it make sense? Not from conventional political wisdom. But in the context of Terrible 20, when so many things have gone wrong and so many other things don't make sense, it's exactly the kind of election results that probably should have been expected. So here we are. Trump still hasn't conceded the election, which he doesn't have to do as far as determining the results, but it's generally accepted practice nonetheless. Biden is about to move from hiding in his house in Delaware to hiding in the White House, and he is still making statements which make little or no sense at all, like offering to retire for medical reasons if he and Harris disagree on policy. Congress hasn't experienced any sudden breakout of common sense either. We have vaccines against COVID now, which haven't been rolled out to the general public quite yet, and either will save us all, or won't actually protect anyone, anywhere, from COVID. We have a new wave of infections and a new wave of lockdowns. We have people desperate for help from Congress because they won't let them go back to work. And we have more businesses closing forever and adding to the long-term harm from this pandemic. But we also have a new year, folks. 
Terrible 20 is now behind us. May 2021 bring us a return to normalcy, and may we all remember just how badly the politicians have acted come next election.